When teaching concentration, often the Forest of Johns don't talk about a particular technique. Instead, they talk about developing an attitude, an attitude of sangwega. Looking around and seeing that all the things that you might want to think about are not really worth thinking about. And looking at the mind's own tendency to go after those things. And realizing you don't want to go there. You don't want to follow it along. That's when the mind can begin to settle down. And John Lee talks about this in his book on Satyapatthana, the various ways of getting into the mind into concentration. In each case, he says, you want the topic to give rise to a sense of sangwega, contemplating the body, contemplating the elements. And then the mind can settle down. That chant we had just now. Ratabala's reasons for ordaining are probably the best analysis of what Sangwega means. It connects a lot of things in the teaching. The world is swept away, it does not endure. He illustrates that principle with a questions about aging. He's talking to a king who would ask him, Why did you ordain? And Ratabala gave these Dhamma summaries, and the king says, What do you mean by these? So for the first one. He asked the king, when you were young, were you strong? And the king said, yes, I thought sometimes I had the strength of two, two people. How about now? Well, now I'm 80 years old, and sometimes I mean to put my foot in one place and it goes someplace else. Inconstancy, aging. The world offers no shelter. There's no one in charge. Ratabala illustrates this one with illness. It's a teaching on dukkha. Then he asks the king, when you're sick, you, even though you're king, can you order the people in your court to share out the pain of your illness, or do you have to bear it alone? Well, you have to bear it alone. There's no protection on, from things like that. The world has nothing of its own. You know, the king argues, well, I've got all these stores of wealth. How can you say that the world has nothing of its own? Rajabala asks him, when you die, can you take that with you? Well, of course not. So there we have not-self and death. So aging, illness, and death map onto inconstancy, stress, and not-self. Then there's the fourth one. We're slave to craving. The mind never has enough, even though it has to put up with all this aging, illness, and death. It keeps going, going, going for more. He asked the king, if you're told that there was a kingdom to the east, here you are already wealthy, 80 years old. If someone told you there were a, king, a kingdom to the east that you could conquer, would you could try to conquer it? Of course, the king says. How about one to the south? Sure, go for that one too. To the west? Yeah, let's go for that one. How about the north? Go for that one as well. How about the other side of the ocean? Go for that too. This is where the real terror comes in. That's what Sangwega means, literally. It's a sense of terror. The mind has this tendency to keep going for things that are going to involve more aging, illness, and death, more inconstancy, stress, and not self. And so when you realize you're trapped in this situation, that's when you want to weigh out. If you just stay with that sense of being trapped, it's too much for the mind to deal with. And if you try to deny it, you go back to your old ways. Well, there's always that lingering sense. There's unfinished business that you're still unprotected. So the proper response is basada, sense of confidence. This the texts don't explain in that much detail. But one of the qualities you need in terms of confidence is what you might call infinite good humor. Because in the course of the practice, there are going to be a lot of setbacks. You think you're going well, and things come along and wipe out what you've done. And you have to be able to get up, dust yourself off, and keep going. One thing doesn't work, you try something else. You see this in the Buddha's own life. 
He tried various things. He developed very strong concentration under those two teachers. And after all the work put into that, oh, that's still not what he wanted. Still not good enough. So he left one teacher and went to another. Learned a higher level of concentration, but still that wasn't good enough. Then he took the route of self-torment, six years of tormenting himself in various ways, going into trance by holding his breath, denying himself food, to the point where he'd faint when he'd go to the bathroom. He was so thin and weak. No person in that situation could do any number of things. One is you ask yourself, what kind of attitude keeps a person going <clears throat> keeps a person going like that? And you say, well, you realize it's pride. As he said, he didn't looked around and he couldn't see anybody who had undergone such self inflicted torture as he did. But what did it get him? It certainly didn't get him what he wanted. He tried something else. Thought at the time when he was a child, he entered the first jhana, which apparently the training under those other two teachers had bypassed. He said, why am I afraid of that pleasure? Because he'd been denying himself every form of pleasure. Like many people who've been indulging very heavily in sensual pleasures, the Buddha took the immediate opposite tack and denied himself, starved himself. So I asked him, so why am I afraid of this form of pleasure? There's no blame to it. It's a clear-minded pleasure. To realize there was no blame. Perhaps this is the path. But to follow that path, he'd have to eat more. In the course of going back to eat again, the five brethren who were looking after him and hoping that if he gained awakening through self-torture, they'd learn about awakening from him, gave up. It could have been a really huge blow to his pride. But he didn't let it get him down. And we could say he had patience and he had persistence. But how do you keep patience going? How do you keep persistence going? Well, having a good sense of humor about what's happening to you in the path. And having an infinite good humor. That can keep you going. You say, oops, another mistake. Well, okay. Try again. Another mistake? Try again. It's that ability to step back from yourself a bit and see what you're doing. And not be so into a particular state of mind or into a particular identity that you can't let it go. Humor means basically learning how to step back and seeing things from a larger perspective. And that's a lot of what wisdom is, a lot of what discernment is. Stepping, <clears throat> stepping back from your likes. Say, okay, this thing that I like to do, is it really good? Does it really lead to result that I want. Well, no. Okay, then I've got to learn how not to keep doing it. This thing that I don't like doing, if I see that it leads to a, a good result, why did I not want to do it? Well, you learn how to talk yourself into doing it. But you can't do that unless you can step back from your likes. And we tend to identify with our likes more than anything else, our likes and dislikes. And so good humor is just that quality allows you to step back from your likes and dislikes, your stories you tell yourself about all the energy you put into something, all the work you put into something. You're going to run out of energy. You're going to die. You can step back and say, was that really true? Well, no. And if you can learn how to laugh that off, then you can pick yourself up and keep going. Sometimes there are step back setbacks. You tried launching yourself on something, and you realize you weren't really ready. Okay, you go back and you create a stronger foundation, and then you start all over again. The quality of humor is something you see a lot among the Tayachans. They don't talk about it that much, but they certainly exemplify it. And this is why it's important when you look at their teachings, you don't just look at what's in the books. You look at them. One of the things that attracted me to John Fung was his sense of humor. And he talked about a John Munn sense of humor. Again, you don't read about that in the books, but he had some good examples. It's 
So try to take an attitude of good humor toward your mistakes, good humor toward your setbacks, so they don't defeat you. And maintaining that sense of good humor is what allows confidence to grow. You see that you can deal with difficulties or setbacks. And you can develop that quality of very basic wisdom that the Buddha identified as wisdom or discernment in effort, in action, basically. We tend to think of wisdom or discernment as dealing with the three characteristics, or emptiness, or dependent core arising. But as the Buddha pointed out, it begins with this ability to talk yourself into doing things you don't like doing, but you know they're going to give good results. And the ability to talk yourself out of doing things that you like doing, you know, are, are going to get bad results. It's pragmatic. It's strategic. And how do people best strategize? Well, one step back from the situation. Step back a bit from your emotional involvement and your identification. When Ratabala was telling the king about that, being a slave to craving. Here he was, an 80-year-old man who would be willing to fight battles, even to get a kingdom across the ocean. He later, Ratabala later, composed a poem, That's a or at least there's a poem attributed to him, where he expresses amazement. Here's somebody ready to die, and they want to conquer the world. He sees the irony in it. That element of irony is not taking an ironic attitude toward the truth. In other words, you don't say, well, there really is no truth out there. It's all truth in quotes, which is what irony has come to mean today. The Buddhist sense of irony, the Arahant sense of irony, is just seeing that the, the world is so dumb. The things that people want most are the things that make them suffer most. And for a long time, they were included in it. That's when, why when they laugh at this, it's not a harsh laugh. But they know what it's like. They've been there themselves, but they were able to step back and see the foolishness. And in seeing the foolishness, that's when you let go. And the contemplation he recommends, you know, the, the elements of Sangwega, you know, map onto the three characteristics. And constantly stress, not self. But there are other times when insights that allow you to let go don't explicitly think in those terms. You just see the foolishness of something you've been doing, and you realize you don't have to do it. It's not just foolish in being done, but it's foolish in being harmful as well. When you can see that, and you, oh, you see through that, and you understand, I've, I've been so dumb. This is why people who have attainments, the noble attainments, don't brag about them, because a lot of the attainment is seeing their own stupidity, being willing to able to laugh at it and let it go. This is how a sense of infinite good humor can see you all the way through.